Hello and welcome to the program. <laughs> the first part of this program was titled The Power of Deliverance, where I started breaking down what deliverance is all about and why it's important for we as Christians to be delivered. And I share the fact that many Christians, when you look at the pattern, a trend in their lives, and you say, I think you need deliverance, their first reaction is, I don't have demons, so I don't need deliverance. But they're mistaken because it is true you don't have demons possessing your spirit because once you give your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside of you, in your spirit man, where your soul and your body can be oppressed by demons to make life difficult for you. So the title of this particular one is why deliverance is important to all Christians. Why deliverance is important to all Christians. At the end of that other program, titled The Power of Deliverance, you can search for it and then watch it. I was explaining about how curses come upon families. And I used my family as an example. And then unfortunately, you have curses coming from both sides especially in Africa, even Asia, South America, where people worship idols. On my mother's side, my grandfather was a Freemason. And apart from that, they took slaves. And the slaves cursed them from their innermost beings. On my father's side, they were idol worshippers. They worshipped worship a particular god called Ogun, that is god of iron. So if you're in any business to do with metal, you have to worship that God, or you can die mysteriously. And apart from worshiping the God of iron, they were Muslims. <laughs> so because some of them would say, well, you practice your Islam the way you like, <laughs> which means you can do Islam and add extras <laughs> because you want to be fortified. So you have curses coming from two sides, <laughs> and you are there in the middle. You are, you are not the one that you know, is worshipping those things. You are not the one that got initiated into Freemasonry. But the effect of what those guys did is, is hitting you hard. So the question is, what is deliverance? And I say the, the, the definition of deliverance is that deliverance is a spiritual catalyst. Deliverance is a spiritual catalyst. Catalysts. And you might ask, for some people who didn't do chemistry or even biology, what is a catalyst? A catalyst is a substance that quickens the process of a chemical reaction. For instance, if you are carrying out a, pro a, a chemical reaction naturally, it might, maybe for argument's sake, that chemical reaction might take 10 days if you allow things to go through their natural course. But when you throw a catalyst in that chemical reaction, it quickens the process and it can do it in one day or two without changing the substance. So deliverance is a spiritual catalyst. It quickens the process. Why am I saying this? I met a big man of God, big one, in Africa. I don't want to mention a particular country. He's known by so many people. He preaches well. A lot of people love his message. His message doesn't hurt anyone. Nice message. And I remember his very close assistant, his, his personal assistant, came like a Nicodemus to see me, to ask for deliverance, to ask for help. And what was his problem? He said he has the spirit of anger in him, that when he's angry, blood must flow before he stops. And apart from that, he has issues in dealing with, with women, which means he fornicates. And yet, he's a personal assistant to a big man of God. So I asked him a question. I said, does your boss know that you have this condition? He said, yes. I said, so what did he prescribe? He said, I should go and see a clinical psychologist. <laughs> a clinical 
psychologists. So the clinical psychologists will talk to the demons and you know, do things. And I said, then something is wrong. Which means that this man's ministry, many are there suffering. And they believe they're okay. So I had the opportunity to meet this man of God. I went to visit him in his office. And I asked him, I said, do you believe in deliverance? He said, yes. <laughs> I said, in what way? Because I knew where, what he was trying to do. He, they used words. He said, well, we encourage our people to read the Bible, to meditate upon the word of God, to pray regularly, to fast regularly. And this was somebody who didn't believe in fasting before. He didn't believe in it. He was teaching that you don't need to fast. But now, to fast regularly, and somewhere along the line, they will be delivered. Somewhere along the line. Can you imagine Jesus Christ meeting the madman of Gadara? And say, you know what? Go read your Bible. Go pray. And go fast. Somewhere along the line, you'll be okay. That's what this man was saying. So which means he doesn't believe in the true deliverance. And on one occasion, I was at one of his meetings. He didn't know I was in the crowd. And he was talking about deliverance. He said, oh, I went to some ministry, some strange ministry the other day, and they were praying. Some were screaming, some were jumping up, some were throwing up, some were... and his members were all laughing. And I saw people that should be pitied. Majority of those members have problems. But because he's charismatic, they are around him. They don't know that they are suffering. Or they know they're suffering, but they don't know which way out. In fact, I know a few of them, of his members, who are suffering. There's a lady, even up to we speak right now, looking for a husband. No husband. And we know it's a spiritual problem. She even got desperate that a Muslim was talking to her by marriage and she was considering. Can you imagine? Desperate because her boss says, somewhere along the line, you will be delivered. But deliverance is a catalyst, a spiritual catalyst. It quickens the process. The moment the process is quickened and people are set free, they're excited. They want to serve God more. They, they, are, they love God. They see that God is real. And they see his promises are real. Because we've witnessed it. I've seen people when they come for counseling, they look bound. In the spirit and physically you can see. Things are not working. You start deliverance. After a few days, you see them lighten up. And the moment they lighten up, you know that a breakthrough is just around the corner. And they get the breakthrough. They come and share the testimony. Oh, and they're excited. And they volunteer to serve in the church because they can see the hand of God. So deliverance is a spiritual catalyst. And the question is, like I said before, is it all about demons? In reality, it is all about demons. <laughs> but it's not about demon possession. Because when you're in the kingdom of Christ already, you're not possessed by the devil. But you can be oppressed. You can be, your life can be messed up completely by them. So it is all about demons, yes. Because when there's an ancestral covenant operating in your life, it is demons that come and enforce it. They're not possessing you, but they're enforcing it. For instance, Maybe your forefather has gone to a shrine somewhere in India or Africa and told the demon there, oh, if you make me rich, I will do anything you want me to do. And the demon says, okay, every year from your, life, from your, from your own life unto generations to come, they, you must offer a dog as sacrifice to me. Say, a dog? Oh, that's no problem. So he sacrificed the dog regularly, and he prospered. He died and went, and he told the ones after him, carry on sacrificing the dog. That's what this God needs. And they carried on. Then some years later, you showed up. <laughs> I am born again. I don't do those silly things. Why do you sacrifice your dog? 
poor animal. No way. I'm not going to do it. And then the devil who operates on legal basis comes into your life and said, your forefathers have signed a deal on your behalf. You don't give me the dog, I'll take some terrible things from your life, even from your family, and it's oppressing you. And you're wondering what is going on. Because it's operating on a legal basis. The Bible talks about legal captives. <laughs> You've been <laughs> legally arrested. <laughs> The devil cannot take you if that arrangement was not in place. So we're talking about as, as ancestral covenants. We're talking about curses. We're talking about involvement with secret societies and even satanic societies. We're talking about idolatry. So you might ask, how do demons gain access into people's lives? I'll just, I'll just spell out a few of them. They gain access into your life through blood covenants. Like I said, the devil might ask, sacrifice a dog, blood. He might say, a goat, a cow. And in some cases, in the developing world, like you know, in Africa or even South America, he will ask for a human being. And they supply the human being. And then there's also blood covenant that someone will foolishly enter into with someone else. For instance, I dealt with a case where a lady came to me. She said, since her boyfriend left, that a spirit has been coming to sleep with her at night. Then the spirit of the Lord told me to ask her, did you enter into a blood covenant with the guy? She said, yes. How did you do it? She said she was in love with the man and he too was in love with her. And they thought it's good to just stay together and get married and live forever together. So the best way to do is that let's have a covenant so that nobody breaks the covenant. So they pierced each other's thumbs, squeezed the blood into a bottle of Coke, and they shared it. Finish. And the devil was there at that meeting because God is not in that kind of operation. So I said, so whilst the two of you were together, was the spirit sleeping with you? She said, no. But when the guy left, the spirit started sleeping with her to enforce that covenant. And the same thing will be happening to the guy as well if he doesn't get help. So blood covenant. And a curse comes into your life through consulting mediums. Consulting mediums. A lot of us do it through ignorance. But it brings a curse upon us. Go and read the book of Deuteronomy about blessings and curses. Lady Diana was one of those. She, she consulted mediums according to reports. We, have, we had in the papers. That brings a curse. And, that, and the devil would enforce that curse. So some, some of us go to mediums. Oh, we are curious. Oh, we need to hear from this member of family. Where are they? We're feeling some pain. You don't go to mediums. They are dead and gone, waiting, waiting for judgment. The spirit, doesn't, the spirit don't roam all over the place to show up anywhere. No. It is dead and the person is dead and gone. It's only demons. You see, if that person, when they were alive, they were not born again, they have a familiar spirit that follows them everywhere they go. It is that familiar spirit that enters into a medium to speak through them with the voice of the person that has died and tell them the history of the person that has died because they follow the person everywhere. When the person now dies, End of story. They go look for another member of the family to take over. So that's why they call them familiar spirits. They are familiar with the story of your entire family for generations. Generations before you were born. So remember the King Saul. He went to consult a witch. As a result, a curse came upon his life. He lost his kingdom. He lost his monarchy. And guess what happened to him? He died a terrible death with his sons. You can be under a curse through initiation into secret and occultic societies. That thing is devastating. It brings a curse upon yourself. It brings a curse upon your family, your members, your children, your grandchildren. It messes them up. He puts sickness in their lives. Doctors will check them to see where, where is this sickness coming from? And they can't find out. They, 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 they can't find anything wrong. The person knows something is wrong, but the doctors can't see anything. 
and the sickness lingers on and lingers on. In some cases, the doctors will see something and the strategy is to make it worse so they operate on the person and the person becomes either a vegetable or dies in the process. The devil is a bad devil. And also demons gain access into your life through curses. You know, they, we have what they call parental curses. Because your parents are authorities over you. So they can speak into your life good and they can speak evil. Which is why in this part of the world, a lot of wayward children. Because they, can, they are allowed to talk. They have the freedom. They say it's a free country. They talk recklessly. They speak to elders anyhow. So those parents can pronounce a curse on you. And it will stand because they have authority. So there are different kind of curses from parents. There are, there are curses that are just said like in a joke, but they are curses. Because I remember when I was younger, whenever I was naughty, my mom would say, your children will do the same thing to you. It's not a curse. <laughs> so, but we know it is a curse. <laughs> but thank God for Jesus. I got born again. I went through deliverance and then cleared all those things out of the way. Thank God the children are behaving themselves. They're doing okay. And we thank God for their lives. And even when they were wayward as well, I held my lips together so that I don't repeat the same thing that we can, that will go on down the line because I know the consequence of speaking negatively. So there's parental curses. There are self-imposed curses. Some people will speak into their own lives. In fact, I'm fed up with life. I'm going to kill myself. Ah, the demon that will help you to kill yourself will now step in. You've invited me. And he'll start making life difficult to the point where you carry out the act yourself. There are curses that come from war situations in the past and even now. A lot of our soldiers go to the battlefield in Iraq, in Iran, and all those places. The Muslims they're confronting, they come with strange powers. They pronounce curses on those soldiers. Some of them who don't die, they come back home with terrible sickness. Some lose their minds. Some, you know, they go crazy. But there are other soldiers that came back, they're okay. Because when the curse is pronounced upon you, it messes you up big time. Some of the soldiers carry out atrocities, contrary to international convention. So as a result, a curse comes upon their lives. So like I said before, curses were pronounced on my forefathers who were slave traders because they captured slaves, they treated them badly, they chained them out in the open, rain or shine, the slaves were there like animals. And those slaves were cursing. Some had their heads chopped off, but because before the heads got chopped off, they pronounced curses. That curse came down the line to every child born through that family. And you're wondering, why is your life upside down? Let me give you an example from the Bible, David and Goliath. The first book of Samuel, chapter 17, verse 43. When David was approaching Goliath with a sling and a stone and a stick, listen to what happened, to what Goliath said. So the Philistine, that is Goliath, Goliath said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? <laughs> and the Bible said, and the Philistine cursed David by his gods. <laughs> he cursed David by his gods. Because when those guys are coming to the battlefield, they're carrying demonic powers to protect them and mess up the other person. But because God was on the side of David, those curses were nullified. And it reminds me also, and I remember also, during the Nigerian Civil War, if you go and read the account of soldiers who fought on that battlefield, especially from the Nigerian side, they will tell you that the Muslim generals, the Muslim brigadiers who went to that battle to fight against the, the enemy, they brought along with them some Muslim priests who is there to release the enchantment against the enemy. They pronounce confusion to the camps of the enemy. 
So when they go into that camp, the guys will be confused and they will wipe them out. So if you don't have Christ and you don't have voodoo power and you are confronting those guys, you are in deep trouble. And that's the problem we have today. We're sending soldiers to the battlefield, they don't have Christ. They believe we've been well trained. Yes, we're a professional army. And then they get there and they're facing guys with serious powers, negative. And they come back from battlefield messed up. That's why in the past, you had chaplains that went with them. Those chaplains had to pray for them, to encourage them, even to lead them to Christ. So that when they go to battle, they go with God, just like David. But today, the chaplain is just there, maybe as a figurehead. Don't worry about God or anything like that. We have what it takes. The Philistine cursed David, that is Goliath, cursed David by his gods. Demons gain access into your lives through dedication to idols. It is common in Asia, in Africa, South America, where a child is born to a family, and on the day they're going to name that child, they carry the child to a shrine that belongs to a different god, and they offer that child to the god. This is your child. Protect her. Look after her. Prosper her. And automatically in the spirit realm, that child is getting married to that demonic force. So that child grows up, can't find a real husband, but is busy fornicating in the meantime because that demon is the husband. So because he doesn't care if someone else sleeps with her or sleeps with him, as long as he is in charge as the, as the lawful husband or wife, then get the lives going upside down. They, we call them spirit husbands, spirit wives. They're having sex in the dream, and through that sex in the dream, they're taking God's goodness out of their lives. They destroy your finances. They destroy your intellectualism, with your intellect. They mess you up completely. Until you're delivered, that problem is going to continue. And I dealt with cases like that before. Some people go to, you know, looking for pregnancy, they get desperate. They go to voodoo priests or go to so-called churches that have connection with the marine world. The baby comes and the baby goes crazy, starts doing crazy things, and you're wondering why. Why is this baby behaving this way? Why? I've dealt with cases. A woman was desperate. She went to one of those occultic churches. They took her to the seaside, bathed her in the sea, did all the, the things they need to do. A few weeks later, pregnant. And the baby came along. She said, from the moment the baby learned to crawl, he started stealing money. <laughs> Can you imagine? And she said, what's wrong with this baby? Why is it? And as he grew older, he would take her mother's, his mother's money, waste it. She was owing. She didn't know what to do. She was desperate. She brought him to me. And I asked the boy, your mom says she hides this money in places where you can't identify. But somehow you find it out. How do you find these things out? He said, there are three ways, Pastor. Number one, when I step through the door of the room, I smell the money. And I go towards the smell, I open up the area, and the money is there. He said, number two, sometimes I'll hear a voice telling me specifically where the money is. And then number three, when I'm sleeping, I have a dream. And in that dream, I see the person lead me to where the money is, and then when I wake up, I go exactly there, and the money is there. Don't you know that that child is from, is from the spirit realm? It's a, it's, it's a demonic child under the influence of demons. We have to take the child through deliverance. So you don't go to strange places to look for help. Your help is in the Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel, through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Another way to gain access into your lives is through practicing or participating in occult practices like Ouija board, horoscope. Oh, someone will say they are cancer. Someone will say they are Pisces. And they start reading those things every day. And the demons behind those things start influencing you. And some, are, some also follow instructions from occultic books, books on new age, 
books that are based on New Age religion, Eastern religion. When I was a student in secondary school, there, was a, there were books that were circulating amongst the young people because we were curious. And one of the books was, uh, called, is, it was called The Third Eye by a guy called Lopsan Rampa. Lopsan Rampa was an Eastern, Eastern guru. Then he now released another book, Step by Step to Astral Travels. Some of our students were trying astral travels in their private time in the middle of the night. They saw strange things. One even died. That's how serious it is. So you don't go into those things. They bring a curse over your life, and they allow demons access to your lives. Dedication to idols. That demon takes them over. There was a documentary I saw on the BBC. Women who are married to a particular god in India. Because they are married to a particular god, they're not allowed to, marry to, to get married to any human being. But in the meantime, they all live together in a commune. Men can come and give them money and sleep with them, which we know as prostitution. That is the level that that enemy, that wicked God, brought them to. And they didn't see anything wrong with it. They carried on. Because the devil knows if they die in that state, they're coming to meet him in hell. Which is why we have gospel to preach. We have places to take the message of Christ to. We have to go to India, Pakistan, Africa, and liberate many. Because the power to bind and lose has been given unto us. And we must not waste time. God will give us what is required to succeed and to prosper on those journeys. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. You know what? There's a third part of this message coming. Bye for now.